Color is a vital aspect to the practice of a graphic designer. It's a really important tool. It's also a really fun aspect of design to work with, but it can also be quite challenging and complex. Color is the ultimate tool for symbolic communication. The decision you make about color should be made carefully to ensure success in your design piece. When selecting colors, it helps to consider the mood or the feeling you hope to convey. Choosing colors in design is often not about what colors we like, although sometimes it can be, but most often it's about what will actually create the outcome that we desire, what's appropriate for the project or the mood, or what is really appropriate for the product that we're considering. This is a fun packaging project from La Tortilleria. They're a studio in Monterey, Mexico, and this is the La Casa de Hugo juice packaging. And what I love about this is color is being used in a lot of different ways. First off, we're seeing the actual product, the juice itself, through these clear bottles or substrates. So that's really neat. Color is being brought into the project through the actual juice itself, which is creating a real great visual of what the consumer is getting. But the other thing that's neat about it is it's also hinting or letting the viewer know how fresh this is. They're actually seeing the product. They're not hiding it. But then I also love the colors that they've selected that are actually on the label. So a lot of these are analogous relationships where they're using colors that are similar to the color of the product. So there's a brighter color green on the green juice bottle. And same on the ones on the right, these smaller juices. They're actually using colors that relate visually to the colors inside of the packaging, but there's enough contrast that you can actually read it, right? It's not the exact same color which would make these impossible to read. The choice of white is also very smart. It makes it feel very clean, very simple, and allows there to be a strong focus on the color of the actual product. So this is a decision that this design firm made that is really supporting the product itself and really allowing that to shine, which is a really smart choice in this case. Here's another neat example from Malva. This is a studio in Cape Town, South Africa. And this is a website that actually sells nature-based therapeutics. So you'll notice this use of green, this really deep green. There's also some cream here used as well. That's really hinting at the organic plant-based nature of this product, which really helps people understand what sets this apart from other therapeutics. It also relates strongly to the packaging which is a smart move. So there's visual cues that are being made here that are really helping people understand what is the differentiating factor and what makes this therapeutic unique. Here's another interesting example. This is from Shermayoff, Geismar, and Haviv. This is the MBC logo. This was done a long time ago. But what makes the logo really interesting is actually it's in multiple colors. You're seeing that on the right in the animated version of the peacock. So why this logo was created was to celebrate the fact that there was full color television. It was actually never intended to be the logo. It was a graphic that was made when color television was launched and it was very popular and it ended up being used and became the symbol for the company, which is very identifiable. But this is another example where color is being used in a really intentional way. It's being used to really talk about the groundbreaking technology that was developed that allowed color television to exist. And you'll notice on the letterhead on the left, the way that different divisions or parts of the NBC brand own different colors within that larger rainbow styled logo. This is an example where multiple colors are being used, but it's being used for a good reason. Here's another interesting one. This is the work for the Susan G. Komen Foundation, and they are all about breast cancer and finding a cure and supporting fundraising for breast cancer research. This was done by Duffy. They're a studio out in Minneapolis. And this is in some ways similar to the NBC example, but also in some ways the opposite. They have really taken over one color. They've really used this bright pink color in a specific shade. It's become a huge part of their brand. It's a color that when you see it, in relationship to fundraising or anything cancer related, you immediately know that it relates to breast cancer. So by really putting all of this energy into this one unique color, they have really created a strong brand recognition for this color with breast cancer research and specifically Susan G. Komen. So it's not a color that comes from a technological advancement like the NBC example that we looked at but it's one where through repetition, they have really owned this color and made a really strong relationship for the brand to this specific color. But sometimes no color is the right answer. This is a art gallery website done by ED. They're an Australian interactive firm. 
And you'll notice that there's no color on this website except for in the hover states when you hover over something. I think that's a really smart move because this is about art and art comes in all different colors, all different styles. And by having this monochromatic neutral base black and white palette, at least on the front when you scroll through the website, it really allows the artwork to shine. So sometimes depending on the content that you're creating might also impact the colors that you select so it's another thing to consider which they've done well in this case. Here's an example where a really fun bright palette is being used. This is from the studio Big Horror. They're out of Athens, Greece. And it's for Oh Happy Days, which makes shoe insoles. So they're the insoles that go inside of your shoes. And they really have taken this kind of fun, illustrative approach. They wanna make something really engaging, bright, energetic and so they've gone after a little bit more of a primary palette they've used really bright colors to try to make this fun if you think about this space or you look at competitors in this space it's generally not quite this engaging or fun of a space and they're really trying to disrupt this space by creating something really engaging really interesting and maybe trying to make insoles for shoes exciting so as we looked at, color can convey emotion, but it can also help to identify an important element in your layout and guide your viewer to what you want them to see. Color can also be used to show relationships between different elements in your design. This is another powerful way that we use color. It can really guide the viewer. It can really help them focus on what we want them to look at or click on. So here's one example. This is a Pickleball Central website. It's a website that sells different pickleball products. But what I love about it is the use of orange. You'll notice that orange is being used in a very smart way throughout this website. It's highlighting certain content that they want you to pay attention to. So on that first page, it's showing you the search term that you used. It's also the add to cart button. It's also showing you the ratings of these different paddles. So they're really using orange to identify the elements that are clickable or the elements they want you to focus on. And then as you move to the right, you'll see orange is used again for the add to cart. And then it's used for the view cart and checkout. So that orange is really guiding the viewer and it's really helping them pay attention to the flow that this interactive firm and this company wants you to go through to ultimately purchase and buy a product from Pickleball Central. Here's another fun example. This is some honey packaging. This was done by Peter Voth. He's a designer in Germany. And you can see this beautiful like stamp-like label. It looks like a postage stamp. But the use of red is really interesting because it really helps you focus on the key components of this label that they want you to see. The brand name, which is Broken Clover Colonies. And then honey, the identifier of what the product is. But there's also EST 2014. There's the Bourbon Barrel, there's Cincinnati, Ohio. There's other content on this label, but the color really allows us to focus on the things that matter. There's also color being used on some of the illustrations, which is the bee in the barrel, which might also sort of hint at, you know, this is honey that comes from bees. It's also aged in some kind of a barrel. But the red is really being used as a cue to guide us through the important parts of this design. Here's one from Marcos Key. This is the 10th magazine. This is a spread that they designed for that publication. And I think this one's really interesting because of the use of red. There's a very limited amount of use of red. There's some on the illustration you'll see on the side of the head of this statue. And there's a little bit of tiny type that says His Royal Highness in the upper right corner. So here, scale would really tell us that the H is the most important, that large stylized H in white. And it is, it's important, but by using red, they're actually flipping the relationship of the hierarchy around. They're really helping us know that they want us to go to that His Royal Highness, and then that that's really gonna cue us to where the article starts. It also has an interesting visual relationship to the red in the illustration itself as well. Although color can make a layout more dynamic, it is important to consider why you want to use color and what you would like the color to achieve. Think about what colors are most appropriate to your message and your audience. Here's an interactive example from Troya. They're a studio in France. And this is a website promoting Peugeot's return to the car race that happens in France. And I love the use of this dark palette with this bright, bright neon oriented green. It kind of hints at this idea of speed, of masculinity, of sport. It's really a fresh palette that hints at those ideas and it's really appropriate for car racing. So it's a good example of someone who's chosen a palette that really is appropriate for the market and the subject matter of this website. 
Here's another one. This is an interesting concept website. This isn't real. This is from Asoma. They're an Austrian-based interactive firm. And it's a concept that shows the World Cup matches. So on the right, we're actually seeing goals that were scored. And there's these different visuals that are being used to kind of depict that goal and how it was made. But what's interesting is it's also color-based. So there we're seeing the colors of the teams that scored those goals. And then on the left, we have sort of a bracket-based solution where they're showing who's advancing to what phases of the World Cup. And it's really cool how just by the use of color and the proportion of color and the way color is used, they're able to show us these different countries without words. This is a great example when by using color appropriately and smartly to reference these different countries, they're able to do really powerful nonverbal communication. And sometimes we go wrong with color, and this is why research on color is really important. This is a Vietnamese fast casual restaurant by Yum Brands, and this is one of their locations. They have a few of them in Texas, and they launched this. It's called Bon Shop, and it has this red star behind it. But the Dallas community of Vietnamese people petitioned Yum Brands to change their logo because the red star represents communism. And that's a real big point of contention for the Vietnamese community. And they really felt that it was sending the wrong message and it was really an inappropriate choice for a Vietnamese fast casual restaurant. So the good news is that Yum Brands took that into consideration, actually rebranded them to what you're seeing in the lower right. They restylized the typography, made it more unique, and then got rid of the star altogether. But somebody who designed this logo maybe didn't think about the cultural associations of this red color and the shape of the star, and how those two things together could be really insulting and really not culturally appropriate for this Vietnamese fast casual concept. So, that's why it's important that you research color, you think about the audience, you think about the product that you're working with, and what colors are going to make sense. Perhaps the most fun and most challenging aspect of design is choosing the right colors. The right colors can bring a design to life or destroy an otherwise excellent piece. However, color can't rescue a piece that isn't well designed in the first place. It's not a cure-all. But color, like I said, is fun. It's fun to pick colors, it's fun to play with colors. The range of possibilities is almost endless. But it's important that you try things out and you really think about what colors are going to work best. Here's an example from Louise Philly. She's a New York based designer and this is her Bella Cucina packaging. And it's really interesting. She's really picking vintage colors here. That's really the strategy that's being used. There are these more muted tones, more vintage oriented color palette that really supports this beautiful packaging and makes it feel more old and established. So that's really the goal here, is to make this feel like an older brand or product than maybe it really is. And by using these vintage colors, it's really successful at hinting and showing the viewer that that's the case. Here's another example that's almost the opposite. This is by a company in Brazil called Sweetie and Company. They're a design firm and they designed this wild leaf active tea packaging. This tea is different than a lot of the traditional teas that are already on the market. It has a supplement-like quality that helps you with detoxing or rehabbing or your mood or things of that nature. And so because it's different and it's doing something different than most teas that are on the market, they took a smart approach to use these bright colors. It's really activating this packaging and really sending a signal to the viewer that it's much different than other tea packaging that already exists. It also is really going to help it stand out on the shelf. It's really going to help a consumer be curious about this product and interested about what qualities it might have and how it might support them and their needs. Colors fall into three general categories. There's warm, cool, and neutral. And the way we mix those colors with attention to value can create interest, enhance a design concept, or convey specific messages. So cool colors tend to have a calming effect. They can appear cold and impersonal, or at times comforting and nurturing. In nature, blue is water and green is plant life, a natural life-sustaining duo. So a lot of times those are places where you're gonna see these kinds of colors. And when you're thinking about colors to select, you might think about these qualities and whether they lend themselves to your concept or the kind of design that you're creating or the subject matter that you're using. Here's Good Company Seafood Restaurant. This is a seafood restaurant in Houston, Texas. It was designed by Principal, and you can see this heavy use of blue. There's some sea-oriented colors being used here because that's really hinting for us that this is a seafood-oriented restaurant. It's also in some ways hinting at us the freshness of it. It's really helping us have a vision of this kind of seaside place where you might eat seafood. And so by having this palette that really focuses on cool colors, makes a lot of sense for the subject matter that they're using here. 
Here's another example. This is matcha packaging for Rishi tea. This was done by Studio MLPS, which is a Minneapolis-based studio. And you'll see this use of green, which makes a lot of sense for matcha tea. A lot of us know that matcha is a bright green color. So they're using green throughout these different applications. They use different greens, which help us differentiate between the cold brew matcha, the matcha sticks, and the sweet matcha. But it's really smart that those greens are being used because it's appropriate. It's really smart to the subject matter in the same way that the blue is very smart on that menu for the seafood restaurant. You can also heat up a too cool color palette with a dash of warm color such as red or orange. If you want warmth with just a blue palette, you can choose deeper blues with a touch of red, but not quite purple. You can also go to almost black navy blues. So what's interesting when we look at the color we have a little bit is that there are places where there's a little bit of overlap. There are cool colors that are going to lean a little bit more warm. And there are also warm colors that are going to lean a little bit more cool. So as you're working on a palette, potentially you want to split the difference or you want to have a mostly cool palette that has some warm tones included in it. Well, there are navy blues that lean towards purple that will have a little bit more of a warm quality. Or you can just add an additional color that will warm up that palette. This is a good example of that. This is Senses Coffee from a Brazilian designer. And you'll notice that it's mostly a cool palette. There's a green being used and this navy blue. It's a really beautiful packaging for coffee. But then they're kind of warming it up with the addition of this orange. It really makes it a little bit more engaging, a little bit more exciting, which is maybe appropriate for coffee, right? Coffee is a natural product, so we're really having that come through from that navy blue and that green. But then there's also kind of the warmth of coffee in terms of our experience of brewing and drinking it that comes through in the orange that's being used as well. Another interesting concept is that cool colors appear smaller than warm colors, and they tend to visually recede on the page. So red can visually overpower or stand out over blue, even if they're used in equal amounts. So one example I have here is from a studio in Mexico City called Human, and this is Pinche Mezcal. And what's really interesting about this one is you might be seeing that predominantly, especially the coaster and the bottle in the middle, we're seeing blue. It's mostly a bright blue and a navy blue, but that one has all of this line work that is in red and orange. And it's interesting how those really come forward. They really take over the design almost in some ways, even though we have that high contrast between the bright blue and the navy blue in the background. So I think it's a good example of seeing how those bright colors come forward and can really overpower the cooler colors. And then on the right is an interesting example. If you just really compare the two bottles themselves, right? The one on the right is mostly warm colors in those motifs and illustrations that appear on the bottle, as opposed to the one in the middle that's just a mixture of warm and cool colors. And if you just compare those two bottles, the one on the right is definitely a little bit more eye-catching. It definitely comes forward and really attracts your attention. And that is because of the dominant use of warm colors. Warm colors tend to have an energetic effect. The warmth of red, yellow, or orange can create excitement or even anger. Warm colors convey emotions from simple optimism to strong violence. These are powerful colors. We see them often, and they're really useful when you want warmth in a piece, when you want to convey energy, when you want to convey strong emotions such as passion or anger. Here's a fun example. This is Bavette Restaurant. This was done by Oh Wow Agency, which is in Amsterdam, and it's an Italian restaurant. And if you think about Italian restaurants, there are these warm places. Typically, the food is, you know, saucy and delicious and warm, and it has that quality of something you might want to eat on a cold evening. And we have all these beautiful plates of pasta, and then there's this red color that's really supporting that. That's really hinting at Italy and warmth and the kind of food that exists there. there. Might be some other connotations that are happening, you know, the the white and red checkered tablecloths that we sometimes associate with very traditional Italian restaurants. But they're playing on some of those cliches, and this warm palette is really supportive of the kind of food that they're serving. Here's another one. This is from Monocle, that illustration in the middle. This was done by Lab Partners, who are from San Francisco. And this is a Spain survey of 2010. So Monocle is a magazine, and from time to time, they do these surveys on countries. They kind of evaluate what's happening in that country from a business perspective, from a people perspective, from a tourism perspective. And so this is one of the ones they came out with in 2010. And if you think of Spain, it's a big, beautiful country. It obviously, from their flag, is red and yellow, but it's it's also a place that I think we associate with warmth. 
There's a lot of warm beaches and beautiful places and delicious warm food. And so it makes a lot of sense that in this case, based on the colors of their flag, the associations a lot of people have with the country that we would use these warm tones exclusively on the cover through these pinks, reds, and yellows that are used in the illustration and the cover itself. You can also tone down the strong emotions of a warm palette with something cool or neutral colors by using the lighter side of the warm palette such as pinks, pale yellows, and peach. I think this is a fun example. This is Sparkling Botanicals packaging. This is also by Studio MLPS in Minneapolis and we're really looking at those more pale colors. There's also a combination of neutrals that are being used on these cans that make them a little bit less intense. They're a little bit more muted, which I think is hitting at this idea that you can mute down or use more of the pastel range of warm colors to just make them a little bit less intense, which can be a really useful tool in design and in the products that you package or the designs that you make as you consider colors. Mixed colors are colors with attributes from both the warm and cool colors. These are sometimes difficult to classify and can calm and excite depending on the amount of cool or warm they contain. So I talked about this a little bit in the cool color section, but these are things like blues that almost lean into purples, right? Purple is a great example of a mixed color it's mixed obviously from red and blue, that's how we get purple, so you're mixing a cool and a warm color together to get this new color purple. So naturally, it is considered a mixed color. But depending on the kind of purple, it can lean more cool or more warm. And these mixed colors can be really useful in design, they're really powerful. There's other mixed colors as well, like some shades of green, where you have yellow, and blue being mixed together to create green. Again, a combination of a warm and a cool color. And so different greens will fall into the mixed area as well, where they're more warm or more cool. So here's a wonderful illustration that was from Dwell Magazine. This was done by Sophia Yeshi. She's an illustrator in Brooklyn, New York. And you can see this emphasis of these different mixed colors. There's a lot of purple in this illustration. And some of them are more warm and some of them are more, more cool. And they're really used in an interesting way and juxtaposed against this bright orange and red couch that creates a lot of contrast and visual interest in the piece. Sometimes we mix colors in the way we use them. This is a packaging project that is using gradients. This is for Color Camp. It's packaging for press-on acrylic nails. This was done by Stitch Design Company in Charleston, South Carolina. And it's really interesting because the product that they're selling comes in all different kinds of colors. They make all different kinds of press-on acrylic nails for all different kinds of people and scenarios that you might need press-on acrylic nails. So they really have selected this gradient that goes from warm to cool, which really represents the gamut or the whole range of products that they sell, making it really appropriate for this kind of product. The other thing to consider is that there's all different kinds of styles of these nails. So having a more neutral approach to the packaging allows the product to really stand out and it allows the packaging to work with all of the different products that are inside of it. Neutral colors help to put the focus on other colors or serve to tone down colors that might otherwise be overpowering on their own. To some extent, blacks, browns, tans, gold, and beige colors are considered warm, while white, ivory, silver, and gray are somewhat cooler colors. Yet these warm and cool attributes are flexible and more subtle than that of reds and blues. So for example, grays are one that we often talk about. Depending on the kind of gray, they can lean more cool or more warm. And that's really about what makes up that color, how much warm tones are included in the composition of that gray, as opposed to how many cool components are used to make that gray. Because neutrals are typically made from mixing other colors together. That's how we end up with these kinds of colors. And so by that mixing and the proportion of the mixing can really determine where these colors fall on the cool or warm spectrum. But again, in general, browns, tans, golds, those tend to be more warm, where silvers, grays, whites tend to be more cool. But that is not a end all be all. Here's a wonderful piece for Smud House. This is a branding and packaging for a fragrance brand done by Tai Chen. He's a designer in New York City and it uses exclusively neutral, which I think makes it a really interesting example. So sometimes neutrals are used to make other colors pop. It makes other colors become more dominant, but here there's a conscious decision to only use neutrals to make something that feels a little bit more natural. 
It's very beautiful. It's really hinting at the natural kind of materials that are being used for this fragrance brand. It also makes it feel a little bit more premium, particularly on the right when we're working with metallic with that gold and a little bit of the silver that's used on the left. There's a little bit more of a premium quality that's being used by focusing on these neutrals alone. Here's a web example. This is Field Day Sound. They're a sound engineering website, and this was done by Henri Heymans in, from France. And what's really neat is you have a neutral palette here. It's mostly this cream kind of color with black, but then they're using this bright pink to really help hint at the hover state and the way that the navigation works. So this is some of the interesting navigation on this website. You drag left to right to see the different projects, and if you click on one, it'll send you into that project where you can learn more about the sound design that was done for that particular project. But that bright color is really helping the viewers see what they are about to click on, and it's really the combination of this really bright color with the neutrals that makes this really successful. The neutral colors of black, white, silver, gray, and brown make good backgrounds. They also serve to unify diverse color palettes and also often stand alone as the only primary focus of a design. So we looked at that in some of these other pieces, right? That cream background that was used with bright pink on the website we just looked at. Or the entire project that we looked at for Smud House that only used neutral colors. Well, here's another interesting example that only uses neutrals. We're using different kinds of neutrals. Some of them are warm, some of them are more cool. It's really allowing us to focus on the typography and the graphics. This was done by H3L. They're a global branding agency and it's for a real estate development. So it really allows us to focus on the materials. Again, it makes it feel a little bit more premium. Sometimes the absence of color can make things feel a little bit more premium, which is probably appropriate for this development in Uruguay. So in general, we have the cool colors. They're more calming. Those are the blue, the green, the turquoise, the silver. We have warm colors that are more exciting. That's the red, the pink, the yellow, the gold, the orange. Then we have those mixed colors, so cool and warm colors like purple, lavender, green, and turquoise. And then we have those neutral colors, which are generally unifying. They're definitely gonna be useful in designs. They help bring a palette together. So things like brown, beige, ivory, gray, black, and white. But let's talk a little bit more about color and how it works. There's some different characteristics of color that we need to discuss. So you have some vocabulary and ways to understand how to work with color. So one is value. That's really the darkness or lightness of something. Value helps to give shape and texture to everything around us. In design, every element has value. So that's how dark or light something is. The difference between a black and a gray oftentimes is the value. When laying out pages, an element's value will be affected by its background and other elements that are around it. For example, if you use a lot of text in a small area, it will make the paper look like it has turned gray. Value is something else we talk about in terms of typography. Different letter forms have different inherent density in how they're designed, and so oftentimes we talk about that as the density or the value of a text. When you squint at text, different texts will have a different value, and that's really how dark or light the text is. Here's an interesting example. This is a map that was created of London, and we're seeing all of the streets. So this is a map entirely made out of typography. And larger streets or bigger thoroughfares are using larger typography. And then there's areas where there's a lot of smaller streets that are all together where you're using smaller type. And those are more congested. So if you squint at this, you're seeing how value is being used to represent the city of London. You also have this area running through the middle, which has very little value because there's not a lot happening in that area. And that's because that's the river. And so that's also helping you see the geographical makeup of the city. So this is a good example of where typography and value are being used, not only in an interesting way, but in a way to help us understand what we're looking at and actually create a map. Value helps to establish contrast by subtly blending shades of color or black and white. So values are also created often by mixing colors together. That's gonna change the value of a color, like what we talked about when we initially started talking about value. But value can also help create movement or direction. Sometimes that has a quality that helps us see movement even if it's not there. So here's two examples of that. On the left is a poster called Relativism, and it was done by a designer in Spain. And you can see that there's a little bit of movement happening through the transparency of these circles. They don't feel like they're static because there's value shifts happening between them. Or the one on the right is really interesting too. This is actually a rug designed by Warp and Weft. 
And what's interesting is the proximity of these lines is creating different amounts of density in the rug, which gives the perception that there's depth and movement happening within it. It almost looks like a wave on the ocean or water. And that's really created by the density and the closeness of these colors. So the value that's being created where there's more white versus more blue is actually creating the sense of movement, similar to the one on the left, but in a different way. In order to make it easier to see the relationship between different colors, the concept of the modern color wheel was developed around the 18th century. These early wheels plotted the different primary colors around a circle, mixing different primary colors together in strict ratios to achieve secondary and tertiary colors. So this is probably something that you're familiar with. You've probably seen a color wheel, but I think it's good to talk about the color wheel because it is a vital tool that we use as we build color palettes and use color in design. So here is the color wheel itself. And here we're really just looking at hue. Hue is the position on the color wheel. Is it red? Is it orange? Is it blue? Is it green? Those represent the colors themselves, the base colors that we have on the color wheel. So we refer to those as hue. Saturation is a representation of how saturated or rich a color is. Low saturation results in less overall color, eventually becoming a shade of gray when fully desaturated. Saturation is normally referred to as a percentage between 0 and 100. So if we look at that same color wheel again, we're seeing the different hues, but then we're seeing them desaturate as they move towards the interior of the color wheel. So you can see how those colors start desaturating and get closer and closer to being gray or some kind of a neutral. And what's interesting is if you're working with a lot of different colors in a palette, by desaturating them, you actually sometimes help unify the palette. If you really think about the interior ring of this color palette, so the very desaturated colors versus the outer ring, which are completely saturated, you'll notice there's a lot more unity being created in that interior desaturated ring. And so it's a good trick to remember when you're working with colors. Sometimes playing with the saturation can really help create better unity in a palette. We also have two ideas here. There's tinting and shading. So tinting is when we add white or water to a color to make it less saturated. But then there's shading as well, which is where you add black to a color. So it's just two concepts that are happening there. And these are two ways to change the value of a color, which is what we were talking about early on. By adding black, you're changing the value. By adding white, you're also changing the value. But when we add white, we specifically refer to that as tinting. And when we add black, we refer to that as shading a color. So we have the primary colors to start. Those are red, yellow, and blue. With these three colors and black and white, all other colors can be made. The primary colors themselves cannot be made by mixing other colors. So when we look at a color wheel, these are the primary colors that we're looking at. Again, that red, blue, and yellow. And that's where they sit on the color wheel. You'll notice that they are equidistant from each other which is an important reason why we use a color wheel. There's a lot of thinking that was built into this diagram to make it useful and help you see the relationship between colors. Then we have secondary colors. Those colors which are created by the mixture of two primary colors in approximately equal proportions. The secondary colors are orange, violet, and green. So here are those. We have violet, orange, and green. You'll notice again, they're equidistant on the color wheel which really helps us see the relationship between them. And you can start seeing which colors combine together to make them. So violet is in between red and blue, and that's partly because we know that red and blue mix together to make violet. So this is another set of colors, the secondary colors. Then we have tertiary colors. Those colors are created by the mixture of an adjacent primary and the secondary color. The tertiary colors are named by combining the names of the two parent colors with the primary element listed first. So red plus orange we call red orange. So if we look at that, those are the other colors we haven't identified on the color wheel yet. And those are all tertiary colors. There's more tertiary colors than there are primary or secondary. And that's you know the product of us mixing together those primary and secondary colors. So we have red orange, which is in the upper right. We have yellow green, which is in the lower right. So all of these are named after the mixture of the two colors that sit on either side of them with the primary color coming first. The color wheel allows us to see at a glance which colors are complementary. Those are the ones that are opposite to each other on the color wheel, analogous, which are adjacent to each other on the color wheel, so they're right next to each other, 
or triadic colors, which are three colors positioned at 120 degrees on the wheel from each other, similar to what we were looking at when we looked at the primary and the secondary color palettes. Each of these relationships can produce pleasing color combinations. There are also many more pleasing relationships between colors based on their position on the wheel. So it's just good to know about this. It can be really useful and it helps you understand some of the common color palettes that we use, which I'll go over right now. The first one is monochromatic. These are color combinations based on variations in value and saturation of a single hue by again adding white, black, or gray to the color. That's gonna change the value. It's going to tint or shade that color. So one example would be blue, navy blue, and maybe an azure blue, right? The color is changed by addition of various amounts of white, black, or gray, and it creates different shades of blue, which will ultimately build a monochromatic palette. So here's an example of a monochromatic palette. This is just one slice of that color wheel I showed when we were talking about saturation. So here is a magenta oriented color that we see that is being tinted, adding white to show a declining in saturation that creates a monochromatic palette. So maybe for a certain project, you really just wanna use one color and obviously you could add black and create shades of this as well, in addition to tints, but the idea of a monochromatic palette is when you only focus on one color and you use different kinds or versions of that color, whether it's tints or shades. Then we have analogous palettes. These are color combinations based on three or four adjacent hues on the color wheel, creating a harmonious color scheme. So for example, red, orange, red, red, violet, and violet. All of those fall directly next to each other on the color wheel. And what's interesting is they're always gonna have a very cohesive feeling because they share hues with each other, right? They're all made out of red and blue in this case. And so they're all gonna have a relationship to each other because they share some of the hue that builds those actual colors. So there's another example of an analogous palette where we have yellow, we have yellow green, we have green yellow and green that are all being used to actually create the ultimate palette. And that's gonna create this really beautiful cohesive palette again because all of these fall next to each other on the color wheel. And then sort of the opposite of that is complementary palettes. These are color combinations based on hues that lie opposite to each other on the color wheel. When they are used together at the highest intensity, they create the highest level of contrast. They can actually be really intense, but like I said earlier, by shading or tinting these, adding black or white, you actually can create more unity between these complementary colors, which can sometimes tone them down a little bit and make them a little bit easier to work with. But sometimes what you want is that strong vibration, that strong amount of contrast between colors, and that's where complementary palettes are really useful. Useful. When they're mixed together in various degrees, they can create neutrals. So when you mix these colors together, you'll actually create a neutral color. So red and green, yellow, violet, blue, and orange. Those actually, when mixed together, will create some sort of a neutral color, which again gets at the idea that when you mix them with white or black or mix them together at different quantities, you can actually create more cohesive palettes. So here's one example of a complementary color palette. This would be blue and orange, again, directly across from each other on the color wheel because they don't share any hue in the way that they're built. They're gonna have a high amount of contrast because there's no similarity in the way that these colors are made. Even though blue is a color that, as we talked about with primary colors, cannot be mixed or built, but you have also the orange, which is a product of mixing yellow and red. And that is obviously colors that are in direct opposition to the primary color blue. Then you have analogous complementary, or sometimes they're called split complementary palettes. This is where you use two or three analogous colors and then one of its complements in a composition. This actually allows for harmony and contrast. You have colors that go together, that work well together because they share that foundation and the way that they're mixed or built, but then you have another color that falls on the opposite side of the wheel that's gonna add a little bit of contrast, sometimes add a little bit of warmth to a cool palette in an example. So here's one. Here we have blue violet and red violet being mixed with yellow green. So that's creating this wonderful palette where you have these cool colors, a little bit warm as well with that red violet on one side, but there's a strong relationship between them and then kind of the opposition, that high contrast color of that yellow green that's coming in there. You also have triadic palettes. These are three colors equidistant on the color wheel. These are gonna create really bold color schemes. It also makes an equilateral triangle on the color wheel, so that'll help you find them. 
And so one example would be the primary triad, which is red, yellow, and blue. So these are gonna have high contrast, they're gonna create really bold palettes, but they can be really useful if that's what you're going after in your design. So here's an example of a triadic palette. You can see again that triangular relationship that's created on the color wheel. Then you have tetrads, or sometimes they're referred to as double complementary palettes. These are made up of two pairs of complements. They're creating very bold but balanced color schemes and they make a rectangle or a square on the color wheel. So these are similar to those split complementary or those analogous complementary palettes that we were looking at earlier in terms of that you have things on opposite sides of the wheel, but there are colors that have strong relationships with each other. The biggest difference here is that you're adding a fourth color. So you're adding another color that can complement the contrasting color. So here's a good example of a tetrad color palette. So those are the main palettes that we want you to know about. It helps you understand how to use the color wheel. It can help you make informed choices as you're picking colors for your projects. So sometimes it's good to re-reference this lecture or even look these things up on the internet as you're finding palettes so that you make sure that you're making really good choices in the way that you're using color so that you can do it really effectively in your piece. Now let's look at using color in your work. What are some different other things that you can consider as you're using color? Well, one is the idea of a harmonizing palette. Harmonizing colors appear next to each other on the color wheel. Harmonizing colors often work well together, but if they're too close in value, they can appear washed out or not have enough contrast. So these are the monochromatics, the analogous palettes, right? Those are the ones we looked at. Those are gonna be more harmonizing. And sometimes the goal and the piece that you're creating is to create a lot of harmony. Here's one example of that. This is Half Day Tea Institute. It's their packaging. This was done by Yinju in Taiwan. And you can see that there's a strong harmonizing palette here. All of these colors are a little bit muted. Most of them are warm. Even the greens are more on the warm end of the green spectrum. And so there's a lot of harmony being created, a lot of unity being created. It makes it fairly pleasing to look at because of how well these colors work together and create this system of tea packaging. Here's another example of a harmonizing palette, maybe one that's a little bit more exciting though. This is for a notorious Nooch company, which sells nutritional yeast. This website was done by Wildish & Co from London. And what's interesting is they're using analogous or monochromatic palettes on all of their packaging that helps differentiate the different products that they sell. So you have this one that's green and yellow, that's an analogous palette, or this blue one where they're using a monochromatic palette with a dark blue and a light blue. So there is a harmonizing aspect to the way that they're approaching this color palette, but what's exciting is that they're mixing different harmonious palettes together, which creates something that's a little bit more engaging, a little bit more energetic than what we looked at before. So I wanted to show this because harmonizing palettes don't always have to be boring. They don't have to be soft and subtle. They can be loud if you use them and mix them in the right way. On the other end is disharmonic palettes. These are where complementary colors are used. Those are the ones that are directly opposite from each other on the color wheel. They can often not work well together, but colors that clash are not always a bad combination if used carefully. They provide great contrast and high visibility. Complementary colors printed side by side can sometimes create visual vibration, which can make them less than a desirable combination. So this is something that sometimes you want to do. Sometimes you want to create a disharmonic palette. You want to really play with colors that feel like they clash. And if you use them in the right amounts or mix them in the right way, they can be really successful. So here's one example. This is Palo Tunnel Packaging. This is a alcohol and it was designed by Samil, who are out of Mallorca, Spain. And you can see that there's an interesting thing going on here. We have these complementary colors of the yellow and the blue that are more or less on the opposite side of the color wheel that are creating a lot of contrast. But then on top of it, they're throwing in this red color, but it's almost like a wine shade. It's a very deep shaded red that kind of acts as a neutral to bring everything together. And I think this is a good example of a disharmonic palette, but that's being used in the right way. I think the heavy use of black and white as well is really bringing this together and making it successful. But I thought this was a nice example of a disharmonic palette working successfully in packaging. Here's another interesting one. This is the 2022 Art Director Club Awards website from Canada. And this is done by a studio called Locomotive. And they really are mixing colors that you wouldn't think would go together. This kind of bright, bright neon yellow green, almost tennis ball color 
with the black, the gray, and then this orange. Especially on this slide, you can kind of see how those colors really don't go together, but it's the quantity of them that's really making it work, right? They're really using them sparingly, and I think that's what making these colors that are disharmonic work really successfully on this website. You can also use color as a focal point. Sometimes a bright color can tell the reader where to look first. We looked at this in other places in lectures I've shown, but let's look at it again, where you can really allow color to guide the viewer and help them navigate the work that you build. This is an interesting one, this special edition of The Atlantic about Martin Luther King. This was designed by Bobby C. Martin Jr. from Champion Design, and I love the use of this gold color. It's really allowing us to navigate around the magazine front and back cover, so we have the behind King, it's really helping you know that this is a special edition that's gonna focus on MLK. And then even the little and more down in the lower right, it's really guiding you through that there are even more people that are gonna be featured in this magazine that are gonna talk about Martin Luther King. And then the back, I love the way they treated the quote and they kind of called out a portion of the quote using that color again. And then the right is something from Adobe Stock. These are stock social media templates that they have on their website that you can buy and use. And I just thought it was really interesting the way they're using that, again, that fluorescent or that neon colored green to really draw you to the 50% off, the sale, the back to school, things like that. Color is really being used in a sparing way because there's really only that bright neon color but they're using it in a way that makes it really effective and really draws you to the aspects of the text that they really want you to see. You can also use colors to calm. If you use colors such as pastels, you can create a more soothing mood, which is sometimes what you're going after. Sometimes you wanna create that sense of calm. You really wanna create something that's more toned down. So here's some examples of that on the left. We have the illustrator from Madrid, Blanca Gomez. And she has this beautiful palette of kind of more pastel, more soothing colors that are being used in this piece. It's another example I talked about. When you tint or shade colors, they have more unity because they have more shared makeup in their construction. So I think this is a good example of that where these colors feel related and they have a strong relationship because they're all tinted in similar ways that allow them to feel like a cohesive palette. The one on the right is interesting too. This is a website by a London design firm called Hatch e-commerce. And it's a portfolio website, but you can see that they're really focusing on these pastel colors. And one thing that's nice about that is it really allows you to focus on the work itself. Those pastel colors aren't screaming at you. They're not jumping out at you, which is really supporting the images of the work on this portfolio website, which is really the point and why this website exists. On the opposite, you can use color to excite. You can use bright colors together to help create a feeling of excitement. And sometimes that's really what we're after in the work. Sometimes we really want to create something that's energetic and exciting. So here's some cool examples of that. On the left is something by Best Studio. They're from Canada. And this is a paper promotion they did for a printer called Glenmore. And it's for Valentine's Day. So they really want to play with those stereotypical cliche kind of reds and pinks, but they really push the palette to a really interesting place. I would consider this maybe an analogous or more of a monochromatic palette, but the use of holographic foil, the use of that bright magenta, bright pink, really creates something that's really exciting and energetic and really would catch your eye if you receive these Valentines in the mail. And the right is an interesting piece. This is a modular typeface experiment from a studio called Amuki. They're located in Ecuador and you're seeing not only really bright colors, but you're also seeing complementary colors. We have a neutral in the background that's really allowing the colors to speak. There's also neutral elements in the typography. And what's interesting is those neutrals are allowing the colors to really pop, which is really helping us see the modular component to this typography. It's really allowing us to focus on the different pieces of the letter forms that are making them up. And then we have this really fun, bright, bright pink mixed with this bright, bright green. It's a complementary scheme that's really allowing those colors to vibrate and pop in a really interesting way. And it guides us through the piece in a nice fashion. The other thing that's fun about this is it's just really engaging. It's really making this really interesting solely through the color. Not that the typography isn't interesting, but imagine if this was all one color, it would not be as exciting as it is with this multicolored scheme. Another thing we do often for color is find palettes from an image. We can repeat a color from an image and use it with corresponding type or as a background to help unify a layout. You know, sometimes we're working with a lot of imagery. Maybe the project that you're doing has a lot of illustration or a lot of photography. 
sometimes you need color that are really gonna not clash with those images that are really gonna unify the piece that you're working on. And so sometimes actually pulling palettes out of an image can be a good strategy to use. And it's actually part of what you'll be doing on the project related to this section of the course. Here's an interesting example of this. This is from Stefan Sagmeister. This is his Casa de Musica project, which was a museum where he created logos. It's a dynamic logo system, which means there's multiple logos that you're seeing on the right. Those kind of faceted shapes in the lower right hand side of this interface are the different logos that exist for the Casa de Musica organization. But what you're seeing on the left is actually a system that was built. So they actually delivered to the client for this project a interface where they could upload an image and it would pull out a color palette from that image and then ultimately help them see how that color palette could be applied to the logo. It's a really interesting system. You know, you don't need a slick, sophisticated system like this. You can always just eye drop a photo or just work off of a photo directly. But it's really cool that in addition to the branding that Stefan Sagmeister built for this project, he also delivered this tool that their marketing department could use to build color palettes off of photos because they knew that that would be a very important aspect to keeping the brand consistent and having harmonious color palettes that would work well with the imagery that they show. We also have two different kinds of color theory. So this gets a little bit into physics, but it's important to understand at a high level how colors are made and the differences in the color theories that exist. So we have additive color theory, which is generally something that we see on screen. These are things we see on your phone, on the monitor that you're watching this lecture on. And adding light to color illuminates it. And this is again used by multimedia designers or any designers who build anything that would be on a computer, a television, or a movie screen. And the primary colors for additive color theory are RGB, red, green, and blue. So they're a little bit different than the primary colors that we see in subtractive color theory, which is maybe what you're more familiar with. So here is a diagram of the additive color theory. And again, that works with anything that emits or radiates light. So screens, televisions, your phone, things of that nature. And the mixture of different wavelengths of light creates different colors. And the more light you add, the brighter and lighter the color becomes. When using additive color, we tend to consider the building block or the primary colors to be red, green, and blue, RGB. And this is the basis for all of the colors you use on screen. In additive color, white is the combination of color while black is the absence of color. So that's a pretty key difference between additive and subtractive color theory which we'll talk about in a second. So when you add all of the colors together for additive color theory, you actually get white. When you have no color at all, you actually get black. So if that makes sense, when your screen is off and none of the pixels on your screen are activated, there's gonna be a black area on your screen. But when all of the colors are activated at once in an area of the screen, that's where you get white. White is perceived much brighter on screens. It's partly why we don't use it as often in websites and interactive design because it can be very harsh. You'll also notice on this little diagram that when you mix red and green together, you get yellow. When you mix blue and red together, you get magenta. And when you mix green and blue together, you get what we call cyan. And that's a link you're gonna see between the subtractive and the additive color models. And those are really important to consider because in this day and age when we're designing graphics, we're often designing for brands that are gonna exist in print, so on paper, but we're also gonna design things for brands that exist on screens, social media, websites, things of that nature. And you need to find ways to create a pathway that creates cohesion of the colors you build between the additive and the subtractive color model, which isn't always as easy as it looks, but understanding how these models work and that there are two different models will really help you as you work in designing for screens and for things in print. If you are reading this, you are reading an RGB display via your computer. Again, RGB stands for red, green, and blue. These are the three colors that create every other tone of color that is visible on your screen. While every monitor is capable of displaying a wide range of colors, there are actually still inconsistencies between computer screens that you look at. This is usually due to the fact that screens are not always accurately calibrated. It also can just depend on the components that are being used and the kind of screen that you're looking at. So another thing as we work with color on screens that can make it frustrating is one color you might see on your screen might look different on another screen in your own household or maybe that your client has. And so doing some testing can really help try to make sure that colors are as consistent as possible. 
So we talked a little bit about this, but the opposite of additive color theory is subtractive color theory. And this is one that you're maybe a little bit more familiar with. Subtractive color theory works on the basis of reflected light. So rather than pushing more light out, the way a particular pigment reflects different wavelengths of light determines its apparent color to the human eye. So subtractive color, like additive color, does have three primary colors, and it's cyan, magenta, and yellow. So it's the opposite of the primary colors for additive color theory. So the primary colors for subtractive theory are actually the secondary colors for additive color theory. And this color theory is used primarily for print. This is how things are printed and made. If you're reading a magazine or an invitation or an advertisement, most likely that was actually created using the subtractive color theory as opposed to things on screens which use that additive color theory. So let's look at the model for this. Here again, we have the primary colors of magenta, yellow, and cyan. And you'll see when yellow and magenta combine together, you get red. Yellow and cyan mixed together, you get green. And magenta and cyan mixed together, you get blue. So again, there's sort of the connection between the two. The secondary colors for a subtractive color theory are the primary colors of an additive color theory. The other thing to think about is that in subtractive color, white is the absence of color. That's the paper or the substrate that something is on. So when no pigment or no color is applied, you get white, where black is the combination of colors. So it's the opposite again. On a screen, when all of the colors are mixed together, you get white. When there's no color or nothing at all, you get black, which is the color naturally of the monitor. Again, this is an imperfect system. This is not easy to work with, but it's just important to understand. This is where printers and developers can really help you as well. These are people that are very well versed in how these color theories work, and they can help ensure that you're creating things that are going to be cohesive and have the effect that you want. When we're considering printing, the pigments that we have available to use don't fully absorb light. So we have to add a fourth compensating pigment to account for this limitation. We call this key which is really black. So if you've ever heard of CMYK, which are the colors that are the foundation of printing, K is the black, and we refer to that as key, and it really helps us compensate and make other kinds of colors. Without that additional pigment, the closest to black we'd be able to render in print would be a muddy brown. So sometimes when you see black in print, it's actually a mixture of black magenta, yellow, and cyan. Those colors are being layered together to make a much more rich or a more black looking black. And when we're talking about subtractive color theory, it's also important to talk a little about separations. Because when you're printing something, which is where we use that subtractive color theory, it's actually a layering of color that makes all of the colors that we see. So here in the middle, you have the final image. That is actually what we want this to look like. But what a printer does is it separates the colors. So in the upper left, you have all of the cyan. The upper right, you have all of the magenta. The lower left, you have all of the yellow. And the lower right, you have all of the black. And when those get layered together in the right combination, you end up with the image that we have in the center. So you can see how layering these colors at different density creates a lot of the colors that we're able to produce in print. So we call this a four color process. And it's the key to how all printing is done. And it's really important to understand because it's what differentiates print from work that we do on screen. So you're starting to see a little bit about how do you create this connection and cohesion and color palettes between subtractive and additive palettes. And it can be a little bit complicated, but just understanding how these two things work will not only make you produce better projects for screen and print, but also help you see the connection between them. It also should help you understand that anytime you're designing something for a screen, you wanna be using an RGB color space. That's gonna most accurately reflect colors that are going to be on the screen. And if you're doing something for print, you wanna use a CMYK color space because that's gonna help your screen render colors most accurately to how they will look in print. It would also help you pick colors that you can actually print, which we'll get to in a second. There's another thing to consider here, which are spot colors. Spot colors are created without combining colors together. They're sometimes known as PMS colors because they reference official color matching system known as the Pantone matching system. This is a company that has spent the entire existence of their company making sure that we render colors accurately. 
and they push the boundaries of the amount of colors that we can produce and use in print. So there are specific color formulas that will reproduce accurately, and instead of simulating colors by combining primary colors like CMYK, spot colors are premixed that can also be used when we're printing. So a Pantone color is really a brand of color used for printing specific colors that only Pantone has and you can purchase from them, but it's also become a universal method of color communication. So there are these swatch books, which you're seeing on the left, which a lot of people in the industry that do printing have, and it helps us know if we're working on a project with a printer, what color do I wanna use? You can't just say red, because the red that I'm thinking of might be different than the red that your printer is thinking of. And you can give them a CMYK breakdown of what you see on your screen, but as we talked about, different screens are calibrated in different ways and show color in a different way. So if he enters that CMYK value on his screen, it might look a little bit different than the CMYK values on my screen. So we have this book of Pantone colors that have numerals attached to different colors that help us talk about color in a consistent way. So the page we're looking at on the left in this Pantone swatch book is showing solid color on the left and CMYK color on the right. So the palette on the left is actual Pantone colors that come pre-mixed. Palette on the right is where we're creating those colors out of CMYK. So we're mixing cyan, magenta, and yellow, and black together to create that color. So again, these are ways for us to talk about color universally. Depending on how you're printing, you may wanna use a four color system or a CMYK system to create the color, or you may just wanna use one ink and just use a solid Pantone color on its own. The other thing that's interesting about this is you start seeing where CMYK can sometimes fall short. If we look at the third row down, you see that Pantone 3516U and then the Pantone 3516UP. So the UP is referring to the process color, which again is created by the mixture of CMYK. But that is as close as you can get to the 3516U using CMYK ink. They're very different. So sometimes this is where you need to use a spot color to get a specific color, and it's where a lot of the value of Pantone comes in. There are also Pantone colors that you cannot make with CMYK, like neon inks or metallic inks. Anytime you see printing that has those kinds of colors, those are done specifically with Pantone colors that are spot colors that are put on press that are pre-mixed to that specific color. And that's what makes Pantone really useful in this case. And sometimes when you run jobs, you'll have process colors, so colors that are being made out of CMYK inks, but you might add a fifth ink, which might be a metallic silver as an example. So there's a fifth color being run on press that's creating an additional effect. On the right, you're seeing a mixing process. So although we don't use CMYK to make Pantone colors, there are colors from the Pantone universe that are mixed together to create the different specialty Pantone colors that exist. So that's a little bit of what you're seeing on the right. It's a little bit almost like a recipe book for a printer where if you wanna make Pantone 184C, you can see there that you need to mix, you know, the warm red, the ruby red, and the transparent white in a different combination to actually make that color. And then that color itself will be put on press and it would actually be printed on its own. It would not be layered in the way that CMYK happens through process printing to make different colors. So I know this gets a little bit complicated, but it's good to have a primer on this. It's good to have a background and understanding of these different color theories, how they work, and a little bit of how printing happens. Because chances are you'll probably eventually work on something that gets printed and it's good to have an idea of how this operates. Again, it's also where working with good printers and leaning on them to help you can be really useful. This is what they do for a living and they know a lot about printing and mixing colors and what's possible on their press. And so working with them ahead of time to make sure that what you're designing and what your client signs off on is possible can be really vital as you work to make printed pieces in graphic design. The last thing we'll look at here is what we call a color gamut. This is really interesting because this shows the different colors that are possible to make. So if we're looking at this entire gradient circle, at the bottom right, you'll see that we're looking at that as the visible color gamut. So those are all the colors that our eye can see. So all the colors that most of us as humans have the possibility to actually see in the world and in design pieces. But then you'll see different quadrants or areas that are marked off that show the colors that can be made through different processes. So this is really a diagram that shows the range of potential colors that a system can produce. 
and it may surprise you how different they are and how few colors can be created through different systems. And this is really partly due to the nature of the two different systems, the additive and the subtractive, but also a little bit about the Pantone that we talked about. And it also shows the limitations of the technology that exists. So again, we have that visible color gamut, which is everything. But then if you go one in, you'll see on the left side, the RGB, which is that sort of rounded triangular portion. And that's really the largest color gamut that exists that is not visible. So RGB can create all of the colors within that white triangular region. Then if we go one smaller, we have Pantone. That's that dotted line. All of the colors within that white dotted line region are colors that can be created through the Pantone process, right? So that's what we just looked at, those specialty pigments that Pantone creates. You can see how many it can create. So it's the second largest spectrum of color. And then if we go one more again, we have the CMYK coded. It's another rounded triangular white area. And that's all of the colors that can be made by mixing C, M, Y, and K inks together through a four process color printing. And now you're seeing the value of Pantone a little bit too. If you look at the difference between the Pantone region and the CMYK coded region, you really can see all of these colors that cannot be created by mixing CMYK inks together through four color process printing. This is why Pantone makes specialty pigments and inks. There's a lot of colors that they're able to make that we can see that can never be created through that traditional four color process. Then the smallest one is CMYK newsprint, which is where you're not printing on coded paper, you're printing on uncoded newsprint, which is the smallest gamut. So this is obviously things like newspapers or anything that's printed on a newsprint like material. And you can see that that's the smallest gamut. It's kind of this dotted white line. And if you're working in that process, those are the colors that you're able to actually print and make. So it starts helping you see the differences in these colors. This is why a lot of times on the web, we see a lot of neon colors and bright colors. Those are colors that are often difficult to build in CMYK or Pantone. So there's a lot more possibilities on the web than there are in print. And you start seeing the relationship between these. If you really wanna build a brand and have color be consistent from a screen to a printed document, you really need to start working within that CMYK or Pantone area first. Because if you pick something on the edges of that RGB gamut, it's a color that you're gonna have to substitute or find a different solution for if you're gonna be creating it in print. So different considerations also shows you just the different gamuts that are possible and the limitations between them. So that's a lot about color. Let's talk about what you're actually gonna be doing on this assignment. So the first assignment you're gonna be doing, which is part one, is to build color palettes from photographs. You're gonna start by finding images that dominantly feature the following colors. So red, pink, orange, yellow, blue, green, purple, and then a neutral of your choice, beige, gray, or taupe, and then we want an image that is black and another that is white. You're gonna place these images in the template that's provided for you and you're gonna pull colors from the image to build a unique palette. After that, you're gonna pick one color, one swatch in the entire file and you're gonna label it with its RGB and CMYK values. So a couple things to consider on this. We want photographs that are dominantly one color. If I look at the photo, I should immediately know that it's all purple or it's all blue. I shouldn't have to question, is this the blue image or is this the orange image? You want an image that is entirely all one color. As an example, maybe you pick an image that is a close up of a pile of oranges and it's all orange. Because what we really wanna look at here is how many colors are hidden in these photos. That even if you have a photo that appears to your eye to be completely orange, Actually, there's all kinds of different shades and tints of orange within that photo. There might even be other colors that surprise you that are in the composition of that photo that can make a really compelling palette. So there's a template for this. There's also a software tutorial that'll walk you through this process, but this is a little bit of how it will look. In the template, there's a vertical and a horizontal version depending on the orientation of the photo that you produce. But hopefully this helps you see that the one on the left is clearly yellow it's maybe not even as clear as I would like, where the one on the right is obviously purple. That is a purple image, but you'll see that there's other colors included. And then again, one swatch in the entire file needs to be labeled with the RGB and the CMYK breakdown. You're seeing that on the left-hand side. So not one per color, just one in the entire document, and that will be the jumping off for part two. So part two is where you're gonna take the color you selected in part one and labeled, 
and you're gonna do some research on that color. You're gonna do some research on the color in the textbook for the course to learn more about that hue. You're gonna name the color. You're gonna create a unique name for that color. And then you're gonna create a layout in InDesign for which there's a template where you're gonna showcase the color's name as well as words associated with its meaning. Also on one part of it in the lower bottom corner, you're gonna create an area where you cover the worldly and cultural associations with that color. This might involve a little bit of internet research as well, but ultimately it'll look like this. You're gonna pick that color and it's gonna flood the background, and then it's gonna be also the name of the color. And then you'll see that you're gonna play with typography, ideally one, maybe two typefaces, and create an interesting layout where you're showing all of the connotations of that color. So what does the color represent? And that's something you'll find in the textbook and also through a little bit of internet research. It's also somewhere in an organized fashion on your layout, you're also gonna show the cultural meanings for that color. So some of this might come from the textbook, some of it might also need to come from internet research, but what is the hue? Here the hue we're dealing with or the base color is blue. So you're gonna research what does blue mean in all the different cultures around the world. And that's important to do, not only for this project, but also as you pick colors, because different colors mean things in different cultures. And it's good to start learning a little bit about how that works. So you're making good decisions as you select color. So here we have some connotations for Western culture, Christianity, China, Japan, France, etc. And so you need to include at least eight of those on here as well. Make sure you reference the assignment sheet. It'll go over the details of how many words need to be there. There's also a template again that'll go over how the assignment needs to be set up. And as always, your instructor is there to answer questions, help you if you need guidance on this project. So I hope you learned a lot about color today. I know it was a lot and I'm excited for you to work on these assignments and put that color knowledge into action.